Hello there. My name is Mashan. Welcome back to the Talking ETV Book Club. And if it's your first time here, let me give you the Cliff's Notes. So my favorite TV show of all time is Walking Dead. That's what got me into content creation because I'm like, if I'm cutting up this bad baby, I might as well just cut on the camera. Reaction videos were born. After being into Walking Dead for so long, I'm like, let me go read the comics because I love to read. So that's how the book club was born out of me reading the entirety of the Walking Dead comics here on my YouTube channel, Talking ETV. Um, I read them live, so it's not a podcast. You just got to watch it on my YouTube channel. So that was the start of the book club. And now I'm just going to make it a tradition to everything that I make reaction videos to. If the series is complete, I'm going to read it. So we did Walking Dead live on YouTube. And now the second thing, which is like the first official thing for the book club since it's podcast and um, here on YouTube at the same time is Harry Potter. Yes, I have seen all the Harry Potter movies. I have full uncut reactions to all of the Harry Potter movies. The link is in the description. I'm, uh, I actually just transferred all my content over to a new platform, so I'm still getting everything uploaded. But yes, I have seen all eight of the Harry Potter movies and I even recorded my reaction to Return to Hogwarts. So baby, I've seen it all. Feels good to be in the loop because, you know, obviously Harry Potter is such a big deal and it's nice to be in the loop. So naturally I'm reading the Harry Potter books. We are still on the first book, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. We are about to start chapter 13 right now. Um, I don't even want to tell y'all what's going to be next after we finish the Harry Potter books. I mean, should I tell y'all? Should I tell y'all? No, y'all just gonna have to wait and see, but it's something that I'm reacting to right now. So Look at my reaction video rotation of what I'm reacting to right now. And yeah, so I'm curious what my uh, favorite Harry Potter book is going to be. So uh, Prisoner of Azkaban is my favorite Harry Potter movie. So I can't wait to get to that book. And yes, I do have the complete Harry Potter series book. I even have The Cursed Child. So yeah, I got all the Harry Potter books, baby. Big plans for the book club. The future setup, y'all, is going to be crazy. But I already been talking for two and a half minutes. So let's just get straight into it. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, chapter 13 is titled, you got to say it in Hermione voice because I saw the movies before reading the books, obviously. So Nicholas Flamel, like you got to say it in Hermione's voice. And um, so far in reading the books, y'all, they doing Harry greasier in the books than they did in the movies. Like in the movies, they went a little easier on him. I learned that in the first chapter when... Um, they were talking about his cousin and his friends holding him down and taking turns hitting him. I said, oh, so y'all was cutting up, putting hands on this child. Okay. Anyway, let's get straight into chapter 13 and see how much we're going to read today. Dumbledore had convinced Harry not to go looking for the mirror of Arised again. And for the rest of the Christmas holidays, the invisibility cloak stayed folded at the bottom of his trunk. Harry wished he could forget what he'd seen in the mirror as easily, but he couldn't. He started having nightmares. Ooh, child, nightmares. Mm -mm. Over and over again, he dreamed about his parents disappearing in a flash of green light while a high voice cackled with laughter, which we know is the big V himself. You see, Dumbledore was right. That mirror could drive you mad, said Ron, when Harry told him about these dreams. Hermione, who came back the day before term started, took a different view of things. She was torn between horror at the idea of Harry being out of bed, roaming the school three nights in a row. If Filch had caught you, and disappointment that he'd at least found out who Nicholas Flamel was. They had almost given up hope of ever finding Flamel. Y'all know these kids been going crazy uh, looking for him in these damn books in the school, and they have went everywhere. You see, they remember the restrictor section. In a library book, even though Harry was still sure he'd read the name somewhere. Once term had started, they were back to skimming through books for 10 minutes during their breaks. Harry had even less time than the other two because Quidditch practice had started again. Let me tell y'all something. We need to get back to reading books. Like people, the internet is a blessing. It's amazing. But people need to read, okay? Physical, paper in hand, really working the brain, like... All of the sense the gratification is not good. Wood was working the team harder than ever. Even the endless rain that had replaced the snow couldn't dampen his spirits. 
The Weasleys complained that Wood was becoming a fanatic, but Harry was on Wood's side. If they'd won their next match against Hufflepuff, they would overtake Fli uh, Slytherin in the house championship for the first time in seven years. See, that's because Slytherin, them niggas be cheating. Okay, if we just gonna keep it a stack. We know they be cheating. Okay. Quite apart from wanting to win, Harry found that he had fewer nightmares when he was tired out after training. Yeah, because you ain't even got the strength to even have a nightmare, okay? Then, during one particularly wet and muddy practice session, Wood gave the team a bit of bad news. he just gotten very angry with the Weasleys, who kept dive-bombing each other and pretending to fall off their brooms. <laughs> Will you stop messing around, he yelled. That's exactly the sort of thing that'll lose us the match. Snape's refereeing this time. Ooh, Snape is the referee, and you know he ain't gonna go easy on them. Snape's refereeing this time, and he'll be looking for any excuse to knock points off Gryffindor. George Weasley really did fall off his broom with these words. Snape's refereeing? He spluttered through a mouthful of mud. When he's ever refereed a Quidditch match, he's not going to be fair if we might overtake Slytherin. The rest of the team landed next to George to complain, too. It's not my fault, said Wood. We've just got to make sure we play a clean game so Snape hasn't got any excuse to pick on us. Okay, y'all ain't got no room for error because let me tell you something. <laughs> we, Snape conversation is for another day. Which was all very well, thought Harry, but he had another reason for not wanting Snape to be near him while he was playing Quidditch. The rest of the team hung back to talk to one another as usual at the end of practice, but Harry headed straight back to the Gryffindor common room where he found Ron and Hermione playing chess. Chess was the only thing Hermione ever lost at, something Harry and Juan thought was very good for her. You know, they love to keep a girl humble. Don't talk to me for a moment, said Ron when Harry sat down next to him. I need to consent. He caught sight of Harry's face. What's the matter with you? You look terrible. Speaking quietly so that no one else would hear, Harry told the other two about Snape's sudden, sinister desire to be a Quidditch referee. Don't play, said Hermione at once. Say you're ill, said Ron. Pretend to break your leg, Hermione suggested. Really? Break your leg, said Ron. I can't, said Harry. There isn't a, uh, there isn't a reserve seeker. If I back out, Gryffindor can't play at all. Damn it. At the moment, Neville toppled into the common room. How he had managed to climb through the portrait hole was anyone's guess because his legs had been stuck together with what they recognized at once was a leg locker curse. Yeah, why is Neville always the butt of the joke? <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. He came through at the end of the movies, okay? They, I'm happy they put some respect on Neville's name. I wonder how it's going to end in the books. We'll see. He must have to bunny hop all the way up to Gryffindor Tower. Everyone fell over laughing except Hermione, who leapt up and performed the counter curse. Of course, leave it to Hermione to know the counter curse for the leg locker curse. Neville's legs sprang apart and he got to his feet, trembling. What happened? Hermione asked him leading him over to sit with Harry and Ron. Malfoy, said Neville shakily. I met him outside the library. He said he'd been looking for someone to practice that on. Go to Professor McGonagall, Hermione urged Neville. Report him. Neville shook his head. I don't want more trouble, he mumbled. You've got to stand up to him, Neville, said Ron. He's used to walking all over people, but that's no reason to lie down in front of him and make it easier. Okay, let me tell you something. I don't even got to say who do Malfoy think he is. Because he think he run all these kids is, I mean, who he think he is, but. There's no need to tell me I'm not brave enough to be in Gryffindor. Malfoy's already done that. Neville choked out. Harry felt in the pocket of his robes and pulled out a chocolate frog. The very last one from the box Hermione had given him for Christmas. He gave it to Neville, who looked as though he might cry. You're worth 12 of Malfoy, Harry said. The Sorting Hat chose you for Gryffindor, didn't it? And where's Malfoy? In stinking Slytherin. Neville's lips twitched in a weak smile as he unwrapped the frog. Thanks, Harry. I think I'll go to bed. Do you want the card? You collect them, don't you? As Neville walked away, Harry looked at the famous wizard card. Dumbledore again, he said. He was the first one I ever... He gasped. He stared at the back of the card. Then he looked up at Ron and Hermione. I found him, he whispered. I found Flamel. I told you I'd read the name somewhere before. I read it on the train coming here. Listen to this. 
Dumbledore is particularly famous for his defeat of the dark wizard Grindelwald in 1945 for the discovery of 12 uses of dragon's blood and his work on alchemy with his partner, Nicholas Flamel. Hermione jumped to her feet. She hadn't looked so excited since they'd gotten back the marks for their very first piece of homework. Stay there, she said, and she sprinted up the stairs to the girls' dormitories. Harry and Ron barely had time to exchange mystified looks before she was dashing back, an enormous old book in her arms. I never thought to look in here, she whispered excitedly. I got this out of the library weeks ago for a bit of light reading. I remember the scene in the movie now. Yeah, light reading. I remember this. Light, said Ron, but Hermione told him to be quiet until she'd looked up something and started flicking frantically through the pages, muttering to herself. At last, she found what she was looking for. I knew it. I knew it. Are we allowed to speak yet? Said Ron grumpily. Hermione ignored him. Nicholas Flamel, she whispered dramatically, is the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. This didn't have quite the effect she'd expected. The what? Said Harry and Ron. Oh, honestly, don't you two read? Look, read that there. She pushed the book toward them and Harry and Ron read. The Ancient Study of Alchemy the ancient study of alchemy is concerned with making the Sorcerer's Stone, a legendary substance with astonishing powers. The stone will transform any metal into pure gold. It also produces the elixir of life, which will make the drinker immortal. There have been many reports of the Sorcerer's Stone over the centuries, but only one stone currently in existence belongs to Mr. Nicholas Flamel, the noted alchemist and opera lover. We'll do him love an opera. Got to do with this, but okay. Mr. Flamel, who celebrated his 665th birthday last year, enjoys a quiet life in Devon with his wife, Purnell. And she's 658, y'all. This man is over half a millennia old. Okay. See, said Hermione, when Harry and Ron had finished, the dog must be guarding Flamel's sorcerer's stone. I bet he asked Dumbledore to keep it safe for him because they're friends and he knew someone was after it. That's why he wanted the stone moved out of Gringotts. A stone that makes gold and stops you from ever dying, said Harry. No wonder Snape's after it. Anyone would want it. And no wonder we couldn't find Flamel in that study of recent developments in wizardry, said Ron. Exactly, because it ain't nothing recent about this nigga. He's not exactly recent if he's 665, is he? The next morning, in defense of the... The next morning, in defense against the dark arts, while copying down different ways of treating werewolf bites, Harry and Juan were still discussing what they'd do with the Sorcerer's Stone if they had one. It wasn't until Ron said he'd be... <laughs> Leave it to Ron to want to buy something. It wasn't until Ron said he'd buy his own Quidditch team that Harry remembered about Snape and the coming match. I'm going to play, he told Ron and Hermione. If I don't, all the Slytherins will think I'm just too scared to face Snape. I'll show them. It'll really wipe the smiles off all their faces if we win. Just as long as we're not wiping you off the field, said Hermione. As the match drew nearer, however, Harry became more and more nervous. Whatever he told Ron and Hermione, the rest of the team wasn't too calm either. The idea of overtaking Slytherin in the house championship was wonderful. No one had done it for seven years. But would they be allowed to with such a biased referee? Harry didn't know whether he was imagining it or not, but he seemed to keep running into Snape wherever he went. At times, he even looked wondered whether Snape was following him, trying to catch him on his own. Potion's lessons were turning into sort of a weekly torture. Snape was so horrible to Harry. Okay, and spoiler alert, if you ain't seen the Harry Potter movies, I mean, I would assume you have. I'm the one that's late to the party. Y'all, Snape is so annoying. I always knew it was more to Snape. I kept saying it since the first Harry Potter movie, but he lame as hell for being in love with Harry mama since they was kids. Never telling her he was in love with her and then being mad when she get with the nigga that used to bully him a little bit. Like, okay, you didn't like Harry daddy. Why are you taking it out on Harry? Harry ain't do nothing to you. Misplaced anger. But anyway. Mm -mm. Could Snape possibly know they found out about the Sorcerer's Stone? Harry didn't see how he could, yet he sometimes had the horrible feeling that Snape could read minds. Harry knew when they wished him good luck outside the locker rooms the next afternoon that Ron and Hermione were wondering whether they'd ever see him alive again. This wasn't what you'd call comforting. 
Harry hardly heard a word of Wood's pep talk as he pulled on his Quidditch robes and picked up his Nimbus 2000. Ron and Hermione, meanwhile, had found a place in the stands next to Neville, who couldn't understand why they looked so grim and worried, or why they had both brought their wands to the match. And I'm about to write me a note real quick. This is something that I need to start doing more often um, when I'm reading these books. Brought their wands to the match. Little did Harry know that Ron and Hermione had been secretly practicing the leg locker curse. <laughs> they got the idea from Malfoy using it on Neville and were ready to use it on Snape if he showed any sign of wanting to hurt Harry. Y'all, I love how these kids love and protect each other. It's just the sweetest thing. It really is. Now, don't forget, it's Locomotor Morris. See, look, I can't even say it right. I would have fucked up the spell. Now, don't forget, it's Locomotor Mortis, Hermione muttered as Ron slipped his wand up his sleeve. I know, Ron snapped. Don't nag. Back in the locker room, Wood had taken Harry aside. Don't want to pressure you, Potter, but if we ever need an early capture of the snitch, it's now. Finish the game before Snape can <laughs> favor Hufflepuff too much. The whole school's out there, said Fred Weasley, peering out of the door. Even blimey Dumbledore's come to watch. Harry's heart did a somersault. Dumbledore, he said, dashing to the door to make sure. Fred was right. There was no mistaking that silver beard. Harry could have laughed out loud with relief. He was safe. There was simply no way that Snape would dare to try to hurt him if Dumbledore was watching. Perhaps that was why Snape was looking so angry as the teams marched onto the field, something that Ron noticed too. I've never seen Snape look so mean, he told Hermione. Look, they're off. Ouch. Someone had poked Ron in the back of the head. It was Malfoy. Oh, sorry, Weasley. Didn't see you there. Malfoy grinned broadly at Crabbe and Goyle. Wonder how long Potter's going to stay on the broom this time. Anyone want to bet? What about you, Weasley? First of all, why is you letting him poke you in the back of the head? Like, I'm going to need for y'all to quit letting Malfoy play in y'all face, okay? I have had it. Ron didn't answer. Snape had just awarded Hufflepuff a penalty because George Weasley had a bit, had hit a bludger at him. Hermione, who had all her fingers crossed in her lap, was squintingly fixed at Harry who was circling the game like a hawk, looking for the snitch. You know how I think they chose people for the Gryffindor team? Said Malfoy loudly a few minutes later, as Snape awarded Hufflepuff another penalty for no reason at all. It's people they feel sorry for. See, there's Potter, who's got no parents. Then there's the Weasleys, who've got no money. You should be on the team, Longbottom. You've got no brains. Neville went bright red and turned in his seat to face Malfoy. I'm worth 12 of you, Malfoy, he stammered. Okay, and that's on Harry's words. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle howled with laughter, but Ron, still not daring to take his eyes from the game, said, You tell him, Neville. Longbottom, if brains were gold, you'd be poorer than Weasley, and that's saying something. This boy is so mean. Ron's nerves were already stretched to the breaking point with anxiety about Harry. I'm warning you, Malfoy. One more word. Ron, said Hermione suddenly. Harry. What? Where? Harry had suddenly gone into a spectacular dive, which drew gasps and cheers from the crowd. Hermione stood up, her crossed fingers in her mouth, as Harry streaked toward the ground like a bullet. You're in luck, Weasley. Potter's obviously spotted some money on the ground, said Malfoy. Boy, you lame as hell. Like, you literally don't have no life. You go around bothering people. Clearly, misery loves company. Ron snapped. Before Malfoy knew what was happening, Ron was on top of him, wrestling him to the ground. Neville hesitated, then clambered over the back of the seat to help. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know that's right, Neville. Come on now. Get you some licks in. Come on, Harry, Hermione screamed, leaping onto her seat to watch as Harry sped straight at the snake. She didn't even notice Malfoy and Ron rolling under, <laughs> rolling around under her seat. <laughs> or the scuffles and yelps coming from the wheel of fists, the world of fists that was Neville, Crab, and Goyle. So it's really the definition of tussling. It is four boys on the ground tussling right now. No, actually five. Yes, that, that's Ron, Neville, and then um, Malfoy and his two lackeys, Crab and Goyle. Up in the air, Snape turned on his broom snake. Broom snake. 
up in the air, Snape turned onto his broomstick just in time to see something scarlet shoot past him, missing him by inches. The next second, Harry had pulled out of the dive, his arm raised in triumph, the snitch clasped in his hand. The stance erupted. It had to be a record. No one could ever remember the snitch being caught so quickly. Ron, Ron, where are you? The game's over. Harry's won. We've won. Gryffindor is in the lead, shrieked Hermione, dancing up and down on her seat and hugging Pavardi Patil in the row in front. Harry jumped off his broom a foot from the ground. He couldn't believe it. He done it. The game was over. It had barely lasted five minutes. As Gryffindors came spilling onto the field, he saw Snape land nearby, white, faced and tight lip. Then Harry felt a hand on his shoulder and looked up into Dumbledore's smiling face. Well done, said Dumbledore quietly, so that only Harry could hear. Nice to see you haven't been brooding about that mirror. Been keeping busy. Excellent. Snape spat bitterly on the ground. Oop, not him spitting. Harry left the locker room alone some time later to take his Nimbus 2000 back to the broom shed. I hope don't nobody follow Harry to the broom shed or like I hope ain't nobody already in there to be weird to him. He couldn't remember feeling happier. He'd really done something to be proud of now. No one could say he was just a famous name anymore. The evening air had never smelled so sweet. He walked over to the damp grass, reliving the last hour in his head, which was a happy blur. Gryffindors running to lift him up onto their shoulders, Ron and Hermione in the distance jumping up and down, Ron cheering through a heavy nosebleed. You know what? You'll get him next time, Ron. Harry had reached the shed. He leaned against the wooden door and looked up at Hogwarts, with his windows glowing red in the setting sun, Gryffindor in the lead. He'd done it. He'd shown Snape. And speaking of Snape, a hooded, you know what? A hooded figure came swiftly down the front steps of the castle, clearly not wanting to be seen. It walked as fast as possible toward the forbidden forest. Harry's victory faded from his mind as he watched. He recognized the figure's prowling walk, Snape. He's sneaking into the forest while everyone else was at dinner. What was going on? Harry jumped back on his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Now, y'all know how I just said I love how these kids love each other and will literally die about each other. They fight for each other, all of the above, all of the above. These kids also don't mind their business. <laughs> these kids do not mind their business at all. Harry jumped back on his Nimbus 2000 and took off. Gliding silently over the castle, he saw Snape enter the forest at a run. He followed. The trees were so thick he couldn't see where Snape had gone. He flew in circles, lower and lower, brushing the top branches of trees until he heard voices. He glided toward them and landed noise noiselessly in a towering beech tree. He climbed carefully along one of the branches, holding tight to his broomstick, trying to see through the leaves. Below, in a shadowy clearing, stood Snape, but he wasn't alone. Quirrell was there too. Quirrell is a uh, Mr. Head Rap Man, right? That's what I be wanting to call him. For some reason, his name is like a tongue twister because it ain't, I mean, in my accent, it'd be Quirrell. But in the English accent, it's like Quirrell. Like, it's, I'm finna start calling him Quirrell. Harry couldn't make out the look on his face, but he was stuttering worse than ever. Harry strained to catch what they were saying. D -d -d don't know why you want to meet me here of all places, Severus. Oh, I thought we'd keep this private, said Snape, his voice icy. Students aren't supposed to know about the Sorcerer's Stone after all. Harry leaned forward. Quirrell was mumbling something. Snape interrupted him. Have you found out how to get past that beast of Hagrid's yet? B -b but Severus, I you don't want me to as your enemy, Quirrell, said Snape, taking a step toward him. I, I, I don't know what you... You perfectly well know what I mean. An owl hooted loudly and Harry nearly fell out of the tree. He studied himself and he steadied himself in time to hear Snape. I'm just trying not to laugh because Harry, you supposed to be being stealthy right now. <laughs> he just heard an owl and he, no, Harry, you got to be stealthy, sir, stealthy. An owl hooted loudly and Harry nearly fell out of the tree. He steadied himself in time to hear Snape say, your little bit of hocus pocus, I'm waiting. B -b -b but I d d don't. Very well, Snape cut in. We'll have another little chat soon when you've had time to think things over and decide where your loyalties lie. He threw his cloak over his head. It's always the dramatics with Snape. Like I can literally see him throwing his cloak over his head. 
He threw his cloak over his head and strode out of the clearing. It was almost dark now, but Harry could see Quirrell standing quite still as though he was petrified. Harry, where have you been, Hermione squeaked. We won, you won, we won, shouted Ron, thumping Harry on the back. And I gave Malfoy a black eye and Neville tried to take on Crab and Goyle single-handed. Ooh, okay, so Ron got a bloody nose, but Malfoy got a black eye? That's better. Love that. He's still out cold, but Madame Pomfrey said he'll be all right. Talk about showing Slytherin. Everyone's waiting for you in the common room. We're having a party. Fred and George stole some cakes and stuff from the kitchen <laughs> again. Thing one and thing two. Y'all know I love these Weasley twins. Never mind that now, said Harry breathlessly. Let's find an empty room. Wait till you hear this. He made sure Peeves wasn't inside before shutting the door behind them. Then he told him what he'd seen and heard. So we were right. It is the Sorcerer's Stone and Snape's trying to force Quirrell to help him get it. He asked if he knew how to get past Fluffy, and he said something about Quirrell's hocus pocus. I reckon there are other things guarding the stone apart from Fluffy. Loads of enchantments, probably, and Quirrell would have done some anti-dark art spell that Snape needs to break through. So you mean the stone's only safe as long as Quirrell stands up to Snape? Said Hermione in alarm. It'll be gone by next Tuesday, said Ron. And that was chapter 13. That was a very light one, y'all. Let's start 14. And I need to start showing y'all the pictures. This is the picture for chapter 14. Which clearly is a dragon. So we might be tapping into the Weasley boy that do the dragons. What's the Weasley boy that uh gone that do the dragons? Norbert the Norwegian Bridgeback. Quirrell, however, must have been braver than they thought. In the weeks that followed, he did seem to be getting paler and thinner, but it didn't look as though he'd cracked yet. Every time they passed the third floor corridor, Harry and Ron and Hermione would, pass, would press their ears to the door to check that Fluffy was still growling inside. Snape was sweeping about in his usual bad temper, which surely meant that the stone was still safe. They don't even know that Snape, a part of the reason why he's so angry, is because he's lonely. In Misery Loves Company. Snape was sweeping about in his usual bad temper, which surely meant that the stone was still safe. Whenever Harry passed Quirrell these days, he gave him an encouraging sort of a smile, and Ron had started telling people off for laughing at Quirrell's stutter. Hermione, however, had more on her mind than the Sorcerer's Stone. She started drawing up studies and schedules and color coding all her notes. Harry and Ron wouldn't have minded, but she kept nagging them to do the same. Hermione, the exams are ages away. Ten weeks, Hermione snapped. That's not ages. That's like a second to Nicholas Flamel. But we're not 600 years old, Ron reminded her. Anyway, what are you studying for? You already know it all. What am I studying for? Are you crazy? You realize we need to pass these exams to get into the second year. They're very important. I should have started studying a month ago. I don't know what's gotten into me. Unfortunately, the teachers seem to be thinking along the same lines as Hermione. They piled so much homework on them that the Easter holidays weren't nearly as much fun as the Christmas ones. It was hard to relax with Hermione next to you, reciting, <laughs> reciting the 12 uses of dragon's blood or practicing wand movements, moaning and yawning. Harry and Ron spend most of their free time in the library with her, trying to get through all their extra work. I'll never remember this, Ron burst out one afternoon, throwing down his quill and looking longingly out of the library window. It was the first really fine day they'd had in months. The sky was clear, forget-me-not blue, and there was a feeling in the air of summer coming. Harry, who was looking up Dittany and the 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, didn't look up until he heard Ron say, Hagrid, what are you doing in the library? Hagrid shuffled into view, hiding something behind his back. He looked very out of place in his moleskin overcoat. Just looking, he said in a shifty voice that got their interest at once. And what are you lot up to? He looked suddenly suspicious. You're not still looking for Nicholas Flamel, are you? Oh, and we found who he is ages ago, said Ron impressively. And we know what the dog's guarding. It's a sorcerer's... Shh! Hagrid looked around quickly to, quickly to see if anyone was listening. Don't go shouting about it. What's the matter with you? There are a few things we wanted to ask you, as a matter of fact, said Harry. About what's guarding the stone, apart from Fluffy. Shh! said Hagrid again. Listen, come and see me later. I'm not promising I'll tell you anything, but don't go rabbing about it here. Students are supposed to know. Think I've already told you. 
See you later then, said Harry. Hagrid shuffled off. What was he hiding behind his back, said Hermione thoughtfully. Don't think it had anything to do with the stone. I'm going to see what section he was in, said Ron, who had enough of working. He came back a minute later with a pile of books in his arms and slammed them down on the table. Dragons, he whispered. Hagrid was looking up stuff about dragons. Look at these. Dragon species of Great Britain and Ireland, from egg to inferno, a dragon keeper's guide. Y'all know Hagrid is the animal whisperer, okay? It ain't no animal he can't tap in with. Hagrid's always wanted a dragon. He told me so the first time I ever met him, said Harry. But it's against our laws, said Ron. Dragon breeding was outlawed by the Warlocks Convention of 1709. Everyone knows that. It's hard to stop muggles from noticing us if we're keeping dragons in the back garden. Anyway, you can't tame dragons. It's dangerous. You should see the burns Charlie's got off of wild ones in Romania. But there aren't wild dragons in Britain, said Harry. Of course there are, said Ron. Common Welsh green and Hebridean blacks. The Ministry of Magic has a job hushing them up, I can tell you. Our kind of, our kind have to keep putting spells on muggles who've spotted them to make them forget. So what on earth Hagrid's up to, said Hermione. When they knocked on the door of the game people, the gamekeeper's hut an hour later, they were surprised to see all the curtains were closed. Hagrid called, who is it? Before he let them in and then shut the door quickly behind them, it was stifling hot inside. Y'all, I think this is when Hagrid hatched that damn dragon. I think, I think that's what this is. It was stifling hot inside. Even though it was such a warm day, there was a blazing fire pit in the grate. Hagrid made them tea, and offered them stout sandwiches. Stoat? S-T-O-A-T? What is a stoat sandwich? Let us Google that, children. I must know what a stoat sandwich is. My phone is so slow, I'm sorry. Stoat sandwich. A stoat sandwich is a fictional sandwich made from stoat meat that appears in Harry Potter. Oh, so this is not a real thing. Rubius Hagrid, that character in the series, is known to enjoy stoat sandwiches and has offered them to Harry, Ron, Hermione, blah, 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 blah. Oh, so it's not a real thing. What kind of meat is stoat? Stoat sandwiches filled with these weasel ermine like rodents used to be super popular in Britain. Ew. 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 Okay, so it, you know what? I'm not going to read anymore. That's disgusting. All right, let us move on, children. Um. Stoat sandwich. Ooh. Here we go. Hagger made them tea and offered them stoat sandwiches, which they refused. So, you wanted to ask me something? Yes, said Harry. There was no point in beating around the bush. We were wondering if you could tell us what's guarding the Sorcerer's Stone apart from Fluffy. Hagger frowned at him. Oh, of course I can, he said. Number one, I don't know myself. Number two, you know too much already, so I wouldn't tell you if I could. That stone's there for a good reason, and it was almost stolen out of Gringotts. I suppose you worked that out and all. Beats me how you even know about Fluffy. Oh, come on, Hagrid. You might not want to tell us, but you do know how everything you do know everything that goes on around here. Said Hermione in a warm, flattering voice. Hagrid's beard was twitched, and they could tell he was smiling. We only wondered who had done the guarding, really, Hermione went on. We wondered who Dumbledore had trusted enough to help him apart from you. Hagrid's chest swelled at these last words. Harry and Ron beamed at Hermione. Well, I don't suppose it could hurt to tell you that. Let's see. He borrowed Fluffy from me. Then some of the teachers did enchantments. Professor Sprout, Professor Flitwick, Professor McGonagall. He ticked them off on his fingers. Professor Quirrell, 
and Dumbledore himself did something, of course. Hang on, I've forgotten someone. Oh yeah, Professor Snape. Snape? Yeah. You're still not on about it, are you? Look, Snape helped protect that stone. He's not about to steal it. Harry knew Ron and Hermione were thinking the same thing as he was. If Snape had been in on protecting the stone, it must have been easy to find out how the other teachers had guarded it. He probably knew everything, except it seemed Quirrell's spell on how to get past Fluffy. You're the only one who knows how to get past Fluffy, aren't you, Hagrid? And Harry said anxiously, and you wouldn't tell anyone, would you? Not even one of the teachers. Not a soul knows except me and Dumbledore, said Hagrid proudly. Well, that's something, Harry muttered to the others. Hagrid, can we have a window open? I'm boiling. Can't, Harry. Sorry, said Hagrid. Harry noticed him glance at the fire. Harry looked at it too. Hagrid, what's that? But he already knew what it was. In the very heart of the fire underneath the kettle was a huge black egg. Ah, said Hagrid, fiddly nervous with his beard. That's, um, uh, where'd you get it, Hagrid? Said Ron, crouching over the fire to look closer at the egg. Must have cost you a fortune. Won it, said Hagrid. Last night, I was down in the village having a few drinks and got into a game of cards with a stranger. I think he was quite glad to get rid of it, to be honest. But what are you going to do with it when it's hatched, said Hermione. Well, I've been doing some reading, said Hagrid, pulling out a large book from under his pillow. Got this out of the library, dragon breeding for pleasure and profit. It's a bit out of date, of course, but it's all in here. Keep an egg in the fire, because their mother's breath on them, seeing when it hatches, feeds it in a bucket of brandy mixed with chicken blood every half hour. And see here how to recognize different eggs. What I got there is a Norwegian Ridgeback. They're rare of them. He looked very pleased with himself, but Hermione didn't. Hagrid, you live in a wooden house, she said, but Hagrid wasn't listening. He was humming merrily as he stoked the fire. So now they have something else to worry about. What might happen to Hagrid if anyone found out he was hiding an illegal dragon in his hut? Wonder what it's like to have a peaceful life, Ron sighed. As evening after evening, they struggled through all the extra homework they were getting. Hermione House had now started making study schedules for Ron and Harry, too. It was driving them nuts. Then, one breakfast at a time, Hedwig brought Harry another note from Hagrid. Oh, Hedwig, I was wondering how she was doing. He had written only two words, it's hatching. Ron wanted to skip herbology and go straight down to the hut. Hermione wouldn't hear of it. Hermione, how many times in our lives are we going to see a dragon hatching? We've got lessons. We'll get into trouble. And that's nothing that Hagrid's going to be in when, um, that's nothing to what's Hagrid going to be in when someone finds out what he's doing. Shut up, Harry whispered. Malfoy was only a few feet away and had stopped to listen. How much had he heard? Harry didn't like the look on Malfoy's face at all. See, y'all be talking too loud. So this is how Malfoy found out and told on Hagrid. Ron and Hermione argued all the way to herbology, and in the end, Hermione agreed to run down to Hagrid's with the other two during morning break. When the bell sounded from the castle at the end of their lesson, the three of them dropped their towels at once and hurried through the grounds to the edge of the forest. Hagrid greeted them, looking flushed and excited. It's nearly out, he ushered them inside. The egg was lying on the table. There were deep cracks in it. Something was moving inside. A funny clicking noise was coming from it. They all drew their chairs up to the table and watched it baited breath. All at once, there was a scraping noise and the egg split open. The baby dragon flopped onto the table. It wasn't exactly pretty. Harry thought it looked like a crumpled black umbrella. Its spiny wings were huge compared to its skinny jet body. It had a long snout with wide nostrils, the stubs of horns, and bulging orange eyes. It sneezed. A couple of sparks flew out of its snout. Ah, that's so cute. Isn't he beautiful? Hagrid murmured. He reached out a hand and stroked the dragon's head. It snapped at his fingers, showing pointed fangs. Bless him. Look, he knows his mummy, said Hagrid. Hagrid, said Hermione. How fast do Norwegian rig ridgebacks grow exactly? Hagrid was about to answer when the cutter... Hagrid was... See, this just pissed me off. He couldn't even get five minutes with the dragon. Hagrid was about to answer when the color suddenly drained from his face. He leapt to his feet and ran to the window. What's the matter? Someone was looking through the gap in the curtains. It's a kid. He's running back up to the school. Harry bolted to the door and looked out. Even at a distance, there was no mistaking him. Malfoy had seen the dragon. 
Something about the smile lurking on Malfoy's face during the next week made Harry, Ron, and Hermione very nervous. They spent most of their free time in Hagrid's darkened hut trying to reason with him. Just let him go, Harry urged. Set him free. I can't, said Hagrid. He's too little. He'd die. My thing is, is all they had to do was one of them love forget spells on Malfoy. They looked at the dragon. It had grown three times in length in just a week. Smoke kept furling out of its nostrils. Hagrid hadn't been doing his gamekeeping duties because the dragon was keeping him so busy. There were empty brandy bottles and chicken feathers all over the floor. I've decided to call him Norbert, said Hagrid, looking at the dragon with misty eyes. He really knows me now. Watch. Norbert! Norbert, where's Mummy? He's lost his marbles, Ron muttered in Harry's ear. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, give it two weeks and Norbert's going to be as long as your house. Malfoy could go to Dumbledore at any moment. Hagrid bit his lip. I know I can't keep him forever, but I can't just dump him. I can't. Harry suddenly turned to Ron. Charlie, he said. You're losing it too, said Ron. I'm Ron, remember? No, Charlie, your brother. Charlie? In Romania, studying dragons? We could send Norbert to him. Charlie can take care of him and then put him back in the wild. Brilliant, said Ron. How about it, Hagrid? And in the end, Hagrid agreed that they could send an owl to Charlie to ask him. The following week dragged by. Wednesday night found Hermione, Hermione and Harry sitting alone in the common room long after everyone else had gone to bed. The clock on the wall had just chimed midnight when the portrait hole burst open. Ron appeared out of nowhere as he pulled off Harry's invisibility cloak. He had been down at Hagrid's hut helping him feed Norbert, who was now eating dead rats by the crate. It bit me, he said. <laughs> showing them his hand, which was wrapped in a bloody handkerchief. I'm not going to be able to hold a quill for a week. I tell you, that dragon's the most horrible animal I've ever met. But the way Hagrid goes on about it, you think it was a fluffy little bunny rabbit. When it bit me, he told me off for frightening. And when I left, he was singing it a lullaby. There was a tap on the dark window. It's Hedwig, said Harry, hurrying to let her in. She'll have Charlie's answer. The three of them put their heads together to read the note. Dear Ron, how are you? Thanks for the letter. I'll be glad to take the Norwegian Ridge back, but it won't be easy getting him here. I think the best thing will be to send him over with some friends of mine who are coming to visit me next week. Trouble is, they must have been seen carrying an illegal dragon. Could you get the Ridge back up to the tallest tower at midnight on Saturday? They can meet you there and take him away while it's still dark. Send me an answer as soon as possible. Love, Charlie. They looked at one another. We've got the invisibility cloak, said Harry. It shouldn't be too difficult. I think the cloak's big enough to cover the two of us and Norbert. It was a mark of how bad the last week had been the other two agreed with him. Anything to get rid of Norbert and Malfoy. There was a hitch. By the next morning, Ron's bitten head had swollen to twice its usual size. He didn't know whether it was safe to go to Madame Pomfrey. Would she recognize it was a dragon bite? By the afternoon, though, he had no choice. The cut had turned a nasty shade of green. It looked as if Norbert's fangs were poisonous. That's what I was about to ask. Like, damn, is it an infection or like some kind of poison? Harry and Hermione rushed up to the hospital wing at the end of the day to find Ron in a terrible state in bed. It's not just my hand, he whispered, although that feels like it's about to fall off. Malfoy told Madame Pomfrey he wanted to borrow one of my books so he could come and have a good laugh at me. He kept threatening to tell her what really bit me. I told her it was a dog, but I don't think she believes me. I shouldn't have hit him at the Quidditch match. That's why he's doing this. No, Malfoy needed to get punched in the eye and get that black eye. No, he needed that. Harry and Hermione tried to calm Ron down. It'll be all over at midnight on Saturday, said Hermione. But this didn't soothe Ron at all. On the contrary, he sat bolt upright and broke into a sweat. Midnight on Saturday, he said in a hoarse voice. Oh, no, no, I've just remembered Charlie's letter was in that book Malfoy took. He's going to know we're getting rid of Norbert. You a little sick right now, Ron, so I'm going to let you slide for leaving the note in there and letting Malfoy get the book. Harry and Hermione didn't get a chance to answer. Madame Pomfrey came over at the moment and made them leave, saying Ron needed sleep. It's too late to change the plan now, Harry told Hermione. We haven't got time to send Charlie another owl, and this could be our only chance to get rid of Norbert. We'll have to risk it. And we have got the invisibility cloak. Malfoy doesn't know about that. They found Fang, the boar hound, sitting outside with the bandaged tail. Why his tail bandaged up? 
when they went to tell Hagrid, who opened a window to talk to them. I won't let you in, he puffed. Norbert's at a tricky stage. Nothing I can't handle. When they told him about Charlie's letter, his eyes filled with tears, although that might have been because Norbert had just bitten him on the leg. <laughs> it's all right. He's only got my boot. Just plain, he's only a baby after all. The baby banged its tail on the wall, making the windows rattle. Harry and Hermione walked back to the castle, feeling Saturday couldn't come quickly enough. They wouldn't have felt sorry for Hagrid when the time came for him to say goodbye to Norbert if they hadn't been so worried about what they had to do. It was a very dark, cloudy night, and they were a bit late arriving at Hagrid's hut because they had to wait for Peeves to get out of their way in the entrance hall, where he'd been playing tennis against the wall. Hagrid hid Norbert packed and ready in a large crate. He's got lots of rats and some brandy for the journey, said Hagrid in a muffled voice. And I've packed his teddy bear in case he gets lonely. I can literally see Hagrid right now with his ass watering because you know Hagrid always wanted a dragon. From inside the crate came ripping noises that sounded to Harry as though Teddy was having his head torn off. Bye-bye, Norbert, Hagrid sobbed as Harry and Hermione covered the crate with the invisibility cloak and stepped underneath it themselves. Mummy will never forget you. How they managed to get the crate back up to the castle, they never knew. Midnight ticked nearer as they heaved Norbert up the marble staircase and the entrance hall along the dark corridors. Up another staircase, then another, even one of Harry's shortcuts didn't make the work much easier. Nearly there, Harry panted as they reached the corridor beneath the tallest tower. Then a sudden movement ahead of them made them almost drop the crate. Forgetting that they were already invisible, they shrank into the shadows, staring at the dark outlines of two people grappling with each other ten feet away. A lamp flared. Professor McGonagall, in a tartan bathrobe and a hairnet, had Malfoy by the ear. Detention! she shouted. And 20 points from Slytherin. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I am so happy McGonagall called Malfoy. Yes. Okay. Wandering around in the middle of the night. How dare you? You don't understand, Professor. Harry Potter's coming. He's got a dragon. What utter rubbish. How dare you tell such lies? Come on. I shall see Professor Snape about you, Malfoy. I love it when Malfoy gets disciplined. The step spiral, the steep spiral staircase up to the top of the tower seemed the easiest thing in the world after that. Not until they stepped out into the cold air, the cold night air. First of all, why am I, I'm getting like so excited reading this like right now. I'm so far the first movie. Okay, so far. So the Philosopher's Stone versus the Sorcerer's Stone book. I'm leaning towards the book. Ugh. The steep spiral staircase up to the top of the tower seemed the easiest thing in the world after that. Not until they stepped out into the cold night air did they throw off the cloak, glad to be able to breathe properly again. Hermione did sort of a jig. Malfoy's got detention. I could sing. Don't, Harry advised her. Chuckling about Malfoy, they waited, Norbert thrashing about in his crate. About ten minutes later, four broomsticks came swooping down out of the darkness. Charlie's friends were a cheery lot. They showed Harry and Hermione the harness they'd rigged up so they could suspend Norbert between them. They all helped buckle Norbert safely into it, and then Harry and Hermione shook hands with the others and thanked them very much. At last, Norbert was going, going, gone. They slipped back down the spiral staircase, their hearts as light as their hands, now that Norbert was off them. No more dragon, Malfoy in detention, what could spoil their happiness? Now, before I finish reading this, these kids better put that invisibility cloak back on before they go home. I'm talking about home. Before they go get in the bed. Because y'all can still get caught. Y'all are at the tallest tower. It's a way back to the... Harry's in Gryffindor or Hufflepuff? I think he in Gryffindor. Because um, she got to go to the girl dormitories and you got to go to the boys. Y'all ain't in the clear yet. The answer to that was waiting at the foot of the stairs. As they stepped into the corridor, Filch's face loomed suddenly out of the darkness. Well, 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 he whispered. We are in trouble. They left the invisibility cloak on top of the tower. Amateurs. Amateurs. Uh, why would you do that? Why would you do that, y'all? Y'all know I always got to do a dramatic close of the book. And that concludes this episode of the book club, chapters 13 and 14 of Harry Potter and the 
Sorcerer's Stone. I am thoroughly enjoying reading this. So yeah, so far with the Sorcerer's Stone, I'm leaning towards the book more so than the movie. Um, but yeah, that's not going to come as a surprise. Um, I really, really, really like this dragon scenario better than the one in the movies. It's, wow. I like that. So the inception of the book club being the Walking Dead comics, after reading everything, I have already, I'd already come to the conclusion that I prefer the TV show to the comic books with Harry Potter being almost done. Like I, it literally looks like I have like four, three, maybe four chapters of the first book left. I'm leaning towards the book, but yeah, come back for the next episode.